Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am going to go ahead and begin our webinar on House Bill 20 policy analysis. Uh, today is February 1st, 2021, and Reaching Higher New Hampshire would like to welcome and thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, to begin, I'm just going to launch in and do some introductions, and you're going to hear a, a few different voices uh, speak this afternoon as we dig into both what Reaching Higher New Hampshire does and the policy analysis we've completed to date on House Bill 20. So by way of introduction, my name is Nicole Highmark, and I am the Executive Director of Reaching Higher New Hampshire. And with us today, we have our entire team. So we have our Director of Communications, Sarah Earle, our Senior Project Manager, Sarah Robinson, and our Director of Policy, uh, Christina Pretorius. And you're gonna be hearing a lot from Christina today who leads all of our policy efforts here in New Hampshire. And has really done a yeoman's work in unpacking House Bill 20. But to begin, I'd like to offer a little bit of background on Reaching Higher New Hampshire and specifically what we do. Uh, we are a nonprofit situated uh, in downtown Concord, New Hampshire, right on Main Street. Um, the work we do involves research in the public education space, policy analysis, engaging our communities all across the state, and telling the stories of students, educators, parents, and communities, and their relationship with and their experiences um, with public education. At Reaching Higher, we provide content and analysis on policy and legislation that impact New Hampshire public education. We provide straightforward facts-based briefs, webinars, and other resources. Our work often includes background information, key takeaways and questions to consider so that all Granite Staters can thoughtfully consider and engage on education policy initiatives in our great state. We are deeply committed to public education here at Reaching Higher. Public education touches each and every one of us. Students eventually become employees, citizens and community leaders. Their success is our success. We bring together parents, students, educators, business leaders, community members, and legislators from every part of New Hampshire to explore how every New Hampshire student can reach their full potential. But the reason why you're all here today, and honestly, why our team is gathered here today, is to highlight and elevate the public's understanding of House Bill 20 a proposed bill in our legislature that would initiate the most widespread school voucher program for our country. Christina Pretorius will walk participants through a breakdown of this bill and the potential implications to our public education system as it exists today. Additionally, we've reserved 10 minutes at the end of this webinar for a facilitated question and answer session. And on that note, I'm going to pass the baton to Sarah Robinson, our senior project manager, and have her share a few norms for engaging in that question and answer session this afternoon. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was a great introduction, and I appreciate uh, being able to share space with everyone today. Our norms for engagement are, as you can see in these bullets, we've disabled the chat feature uh, for everyone, ensuring that we can all focus on the content that's being presented. Um, the Q&A feature is enabled, and I will help moderate uh, the Q&A session in the last 10 minutes, as Nicole has alluded to at the close of the presentation. Um, and we'll hold space uh, for all of our staff to answer whatever questions might come up. And please know that if you have any questions involving uh, public education, um, policy, or anything that relates to public education, you can please reach out to us and we'll share our contact information at the close of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I'll kick it off. Thanks everyone for being here and thanks Sarah and Nicole for the, for the introductions. Um, this is Christina Pretorius. I am the policy director here at Reaching Higher. 
And before we begin, um, we thought it would be helpful to give you an idea of what school looks like in New Hampshire right now. Our public schools serve more than 90% of our children, about 160,000 this school year. Um, that's down about 4% from last year, largely due to the pandemic, but also due to the natural decline in the number of children in the state, which has been, that's been pretty consistent uh, at about one to 2% a year of, of a decline there. Private schools serve about 16,000 students and before the pandemic, they've also seen a continual decline in enrollment. Um, however, they did see an enrollment increase of about 3% this year, again, largely due to the pandemic. Um, and since HB 20 is a school quote school choice bill, um, we thought it would be helpful to give you some more information about the state's current choice program, the Education Tax Credit Scholarship Program. That allows families to receive a scholarship for private school tuition, homeschool expenses, and, and some other expenses. And they awarded over 600 scholarships this year. Um, it's funded by donations. And before the pandemic, the scholarship organizations reported about $1.7 million in unexpended donations. However, they do now report a wait list. Uh, the governor allocated about $1.5 million in CARES Act funding last summer, right, right around the July time period, um, which we've heard has not yet been released. And so in thinking about that, that sort of overview of school in New Hampshire, um, I think a question that we all want to ask might be this, will this program, House Bill 20, help to strengthen our state our economy and prepare our students, current and future, for life in the 21st century. This proposal, along with the funding cuts, that $89 million um, that we're, we anticipate next school year, really presents a, a reckoning, a crosswords for our state. And I think that's something that we all need to grapple with and keep in mind as we, as we talk through this proposal. So in really basic terms, HB 20 creates a statewide voucher program in New Hampshire where parents and guardians can receive taxpayer funded education savings accounts for between $3,700 and about $8,400. Parents can then use those accounts to pay for private school tuition, homeschooling expenses, internet costs, computers, tutors, basically anything that families might need for school, might need for education but they'd have to disenroll their student full-time from public school. So as it's written, it's not to supplement their public school and a parent can't say buy a computer for their kid who's enrolled in public school full-time. Um, and that, that's, that's a really important point that we wanted to note here. Um, as we've seen brought up in some advocacy materials for HB 20, um, they do appear to be marketing this as open to everyone but it's only open to those who are not enrolled full-time in their public schools. Um, HB 20, in reviewing this bill, we found that it really does have substantially fewer protections for students, less transparency and oversight of public funds, and almost no accountability for ensuring that programs funded by taxpayer dollars are being used appropriately or effectively. So let's, let's dive in. Um, we're gonna be focusing on a few key areas during this webinar, eligibility, approved uses of those funds, accountability, some protections, um, oversight. And if you have any questions, like Sarah said, please be sure to add them to the, that Q&A box. And if we don't get to them to the end, we'll be posting this entire webinar online and we can include them there. So looking at the eligibility criteria, we find that nearly all of New Hampshire's children would be eligible for this program. Again, they would have to disenroll from their public schools full time, according to the bill text, the current bill text, but HB 20 would create the most sweeping program in the country right now. And looking at the scholarship amounts in the 2022-2023 school year, which is the one coming up, um, families 
would receive under the current bill um, $3,786 per student in base adequacy, minus administrative fees that the independent scholarship organization can retain, um, which is maximum of 10%. It's, it's anywhere from zero to 10%. Um, they, they're able to set that fee. Um, and they could receive additional aid if they qualified for any of these differentiated aid programs here. So for example, um, students who qualify for that free and reduced lunch could, could get an additional $1,893. Um, students with disabilities who have IEPs, 504 plans, um, they would receive the $2,037 special education differentiated aid. EL, uh, English language learner students would receive the the additional $741. Um, again, all of that is minus the administrative fee, but if we look sort of holistically, um, we can see that, um, for instance, a student with a disability who also qualifies for the free and reduced lunch program would receive about $8,400 minus those fees. When it comes to the, the use of these funds, there are very few limitations on the approved uses. Um, families could use the funds for private school tuition. Um, they could uh, uh, currently out of state as well. There's no requirement that these funds have to be used for schools in state. They could be used out of state as it's written. Um, homeschooling expenses, technology, software, internet connectivity, transportation, um, and a number of other education related expenses. One concern that, that comes up is that of misuse. In other states that have initiated voucher programs, there have been significant instances of fraud and abuse. Arizona is one example, um, and we're using Arizona here because it's been a state that uh, bill advocates and New Hampshire's own state agencies have pointed to as a sort of flagship program. And in Arizona in 2016, their attorney general found about $100,000 of misuse in the span of six months. Um, the, straight, the state strengthened their oversight as a result of that finding, uh, but two years later, they found that misuse persisted and in at least one area actually got worse. Um, but it, it, it goes beyond that really. Um, Florida, who also has one of the other longest standing voucher programs in the country, they also struggle with misuse uh, so much that the Orlando Sentinel published an entire series called Schools Without Rules. On, on these voucher programs, the schools that accept those voucher funds. And um, as far as academic accountability, um, there are no stated measures for determining student progress in the current version of the bill. In SB 193, which for those of us who have been following sort of this discussion for a while, this bill is very similar to the SB 193 that was originally proposed in 2017, later modified. Um, and in, in SB 193, students were required to take the statewide assessment, but we don't see those protections here. The scholarship organization isn't required to collect a report on student growth or progress, um, report cards, graduation rates, or any other indicators of academic progress. Education providers aren't required to submit details of any of their operations, their educational practices, their curriculum, or, or those kinds of things. We, we don't see that in, in this bill. Um, so we do see that there's really this fundamental lack of transparency in HB 20. Um, and as a researcher pointed out, and I'm gonna read this quote because um, it, 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 it poses a really important question of, for school choice families, transparency is necessary if the policy goals articulated in voucher laws are to be achieved. And does the school provide sufficient information for families to make informed choices? And so we find that um, this bill does not require um, education service providers or, or, or the, the, the independent scholarship organization to um, provide families with, with really any information on, on their programs, their outcomes, or their uh, student progress. There are also no provisions in the bill that would protect students from discrimination. 
in, in HB 20 as written right now. The bill does protect education service providers from being discriminated against based on their re religious affiliation, but there's nothing in HB 20 that would require education providers that accept taxpayer dollars from adhering to the same non-discrimination laws as public schools. Um, in fact, there's text in the bill that protects education providers from having to change their policies because they accept public funds. And so the National Coalition for Public Education had noted that schools that accept vouchers, they don't provide the same rights and protections as students in public schools. Private schools, they, they might have their own rules with in terms of protections and that kind of thing, but in this bill, in HB 20 as written, there are no stated protections for students or their families. Um, and Gary Reyna, who is a reporter for In-Depth New Hampshire, noted this as well in an article over the weekend, which we saw, and we wanted to, to note this as well. And he had said, quote, the schools do, do not have to follow state or federal education regulations, guidelines, or standards because they would essentially be private or non-governmental organizations or providers. So we see that um, there really is this buffer baked into the bill of just because they accept public funds doesn't mean that they necessarily have to play by the same rules. And um, another, another note when it comes to students with disabilities, participation in the voucher program, um, the bill states uh, has the same effect as a parental placement under federal law, which might mean that key protections provided for students with disabilities may no longer apply. And that includes the right to a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment, as well as the services and rights that are guaranteed in public school. And so while the independent scholarship organization, the one that administers this, this voucher program, has to notify families of changes in their rights, there's really no clarification on in the bill of when parents and families have to be notified, how they have to be notified, or to what extent they have to be notified. And this is a really critical point because the Government Accountability Office found that in other states, parents were not typically fully notified about what exactly happens or how their rights might change under federal law when selecting a voucher. They weren't told upfront. They didn't understand the changes and we don't see the protections in this bill that would require that parents really fully understand what, 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 like, what, what does this mean? How do their rights change? Um, and the current version of HB 20 doesn't require a briefing from schools or the scholarship organization to ensure that, that families really understand sort of what, what, what happens next, like in taking this, what's the next step? So HB 20 um, also doesn't provide substantive, uh, substantive public oversight of scholarship organizations nor does it require the basic governance provisions that would protect against abuse of public dollars. The bill does place a lot of authority on the independent scholarship organization. It gives them the power to determine eligibility for the program and eligibility for differentiated aid. Um, they, they maintain a list of allowable uses. Uh, they manage the education service providers, including the approval and removal of those accepted providers. They conduct random independent audits of accounts. Um, they, have to, they have to randomly audit accounts every year, um, individual ESA accounts. Um, but there's really no substantive oversight of the actual scholarship organization itself. There's no requirement of a financial audit for the organization. There's no requirement that the organization has to uphold key conflict of interest provisions. And there's no requirement that the, um, the organization audit every single ESA. The, the bill states random independent audits, um, which we see as a key difference from SB 193, when, uh, which I believe if I remember correctly, they had to, in later versions of the bill, had to audit each one. They had to check and make sure that, that, that people were really following the rules. Um, and the bill also doesn't prohibit education providers 
from providing gifts or donations to the scholarship organization, which is the organization that, that, that determines whether or not those providers can participate, that can accept those public dollars. So we, we really do see a lack of basic provisions that could protect against a, the abuse of these taxpayer funds. And in looking at the, the research on voucher programs nationwide, we find that voucher programs have actually been shown to hurt student outcomes. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these bullets here, uh, Public Funds for Public Schools has done a lot of research on, on, on some of the um, independent research that's been done. Um, Long-term studies of voucher programs by independent research organizations and universities have shown that participants in voucher programs have significantly lower math and reading scores than those who don't. And that those dips, they persist for years after the initial study. So um, some, some advocates say, well, you know, of course there might be dips because uh, they're changing schools. It's a change of environment. They have to get adjusted. But, but the research has shown that, has suggested that these, this, is, this is for many years after. So it, it, it can't be all attributed to changes of environment and, and, and reasons like that. And other short-term studies suggest that voucher programs hurt or have a statistically insignificant impact on student outcomes. Um, studies of those programs have found that participation did not improve parent satisfaction in their schools or perceptions of student safety, and that improvements in outcomes are likely attributable to other factors like, um, like, like, other, like students leaving the system. And so HB 20 as proposed would be the most far reaching voucher bill in the country. Um, it has substantially fewer protections for students, less transparency and oversight of public funds and almost no accountability for ensuring that programs funded by taxpayer dollars are being used appropriately or effectively. And there are, um, there are a number of open questions as well. So when looking at the bill, um, some of the questions are, do the accountability requirements in the Claremont decision affect HB 20? There, there, there are some considerations there that, that may affect it. Um, when looking at the eligibility requirements, there appears to be redundancy in naming remote and hybrid students. And what is the intent behind naming those students? So we see that, um, in, in the eligibility requirements that um, it, it, it states remote and hybrid students, but then it also states students who attend a public school, a public academy, a public charter school, and a non-public school. So um, it appears that that, that that is an umbrella. And so why, why point out remote and hybrid students? Why highlight those? Um, so that's an open question. Um, another within the the eligibility requirements is the definition of quote assessment proficiency. Um, there's there's some ambiguity there. What specific assessment are they are the um, the sponsors referring to? Which grades? Which subjects? Um, so those are some open questions as well. Um, we we find that under the eligibility uh, requirements, home educated students are not specifically named in those eligibility categories? And was this intentional um, or, or is, there, is there something else there? Uh, the signed agreement for the voucher program, it does satisfy the state requirement for compulsory attendance in, in RSA 193. And um, are, are there downstream effects for that? Like what, what could happen as a result of, of having that signing the, the agreement, having that being the compulsory attendance requirement, having that meet that requirement. And finally, the bill includes a provision for the State Board of Education to implement rules regarding the program. And I think a really important question here is the legislative intent. Neither SB 193 nor the Education Tax Credit Program have related rules. And so what would be the purpose of state board rules 
um, on an ESA program, on a voucher program. So our communities are struggling under an inequitable funding system, which will culminate in an $89 million drop in state funding next year. But lawmakers' top priority this session is to enact the most far-reaching voucher program in the country. And as we end this presentation, we leave you, the audience, with this question. What kind of state do we want 5, 10, 15 years from now?